Welcome to another edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have the privilege to look together into this wonderful, marvelous Word of God to attempt to discover truth. I say to attempt because even though we know the Bible is the absolute source of all truth, it has no... Uh, it, it has no errors in it of any kind in the original languages, that is. Their uh, translation might here occasionally have a wrong word, but most of the time even those translations are quite accurate. And uh, we know, and we also know, that we have to search out, we have to compare Scripture with Scripture in order to find that truth. And even more important than that, we have to be praying that God will open our spiritual eyes. We could be the most brilliant man in the world or woman in the world and, and uh, spend all our hours searching the Bible. And if we're not praying for, for illumination, for God to enter into our search, we'll never make it. We'll never make it. The Bible is a spiritual book. It's a different kind of a book than anybody else has anywhere in the world. But this is your program, and we want to talk with you or face your question, whatever it is, to see what's, uh, what you're thinking about. And so shall we take our first call tonight, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, I um, recently got married, and... I was wondering, as far as donations go, if I or my husband make a donation, can that be, can that count for the both of us as making it, or does it have to be individual? Let's say the husband donates, can that be um, applied to like the husband and wife donating, or is it applied to the individual? Well, who's making the application? Are you thinking of God making the application? You see, don't look at this too physically. Look at it from the standpoint of God seeing your heart. You have a desire to serve the Lord. Your husband has a desire to serve the Lord. And uh, uh, God doesn't line up points and say, well, now she makes a certain number of points and her husband, he makes a certain number of points. It isn't, that isn't, that isn't the way it is at all. It's what's going on in your heart. Uh, that, and whether you, and remember from another standpoint, you and your husband are one. When God joins us together in marriage, we are one. So what your husband does, if he has your approval, uh, uh, that, that means it applies to both of you. So I would not be concerned with matters like that. I would be more concerned with just a general attitude. Uh, both yourself and your husband and of course you have to answer for yourself you can't answer for your husband do I really really love the Lord and want to do the very best for him and whether it's through my husband's giving or whether it's through mine that's uh, that's really unimportant but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Brother Camping, good evening. I want to say also good evening to uh, Brother Mark Abraham, my neighbor. Um, you talked some time ago about the um, book of Revelation, Armageddon, about the rising up of the different countries. Um, is there any relation? I know I've listened to your teachings for many, many years, and you say not to look at the world for, for, for signs that come to an end, but is there any kind of um, relationship of what's going on in the, maybe the Middle East today and, and maybe to the book of Revelation a little bit about the countries rising up against each other? Absolutely not. Not. Uh, what is going on in the world today and so far as the tensions that exist between various countries and there are some very bitter tensions uh, which potentially could blow up into any kind of a war. But that's the way, to some degree, the whole world has always been. There are wars and, and rumors of wars going on. In our day, we don't get rumors. We get the first hand, uh, uh, the first hand uh, no notice of it about 20 seconds after it begins because of modern communication. 
but that has nothing to do with the end of the world. Nothing to do with Armageddon. Nothing to do with uh, it is uh, the, the, and the whole business of the end of the world is a spiritual situation in which God now has given us the date when he will rapture all the true believers and it will be the end of the salvation program for the world. It's only about three years away. and uh, and uh, But the world, uh, it, it, it seems to be oblivious to this. It's in virtually complete denial, except that there is a great multitude that God speaks about in the Bible that at this time is becoming saved, and that is the wonderful news out of this uh, present time. But uh, insofar as what's happening in Iraq and in Iran and in uh, Afghanistan and all these other countries, the African countries, has nothing, nothing to do with the end of the world, even though all kinds of preachers are trying to tie all that together, but they're doing so because they uh, they do not understand how God has written the Bible. Is it possible for a, uh, a, a believer to stray away from the Lord for a while and then come back into him knowing that he's done wrong? Well, now, let me ask the question. What happens when we become truly saved? We become a new person. We are given a brand new resurrected soul. The Bible says in First Peter, First John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God, and that is what it is. It's like we've been born again in our soul existence in which we have eternal life. And it says, that which is born of God, I cannot sin. And so there's an intense desire in the life of a true believer not to sin. He is very, very uncomfortable when he does, because in his new resurrected soul he doesn't want to. So he's not going to stray away for a while. He just won't, because the moment he begins to stray away, he's going to feel terrible. He's going to feel horrible. Uh, he is just uh, contrary to his new personality altogether. If we become saved, we are eternally saved. And we uh, eternally have a, a real desire to do the will of God only because we're still living in a body that has not yet been received. We haven't received our glorified spiritual body. We potentially can fall into sin very definitely. But if we do, we feel miserable and, and we, we want to try to get away from that as fast as can uh, and try to do it God's way all the time. But thank you for calling. You see, the problem today is that there are millions, literally millions and millions of people who claim to be Christians, who claim to be born-again Christians, because they have been shown by their church how to become saved. And they have been, they followed all the steps very accurate, very carefully, getting baptized in water and making a profession of faith and, and uh, lining up with the church, becoming a good church member. And they are, every one of them is convinced he is a child of God and eternally secure. But the fact is, they are all trusting in a salvation program that is not from the Bible. Oh, yes, it, it sounds like it is. They use verses from the Bible, but they don't understand what salvation really is. And they have not followed the biblical rules as to what salvation uh, that we have to wait upon God entirely. Now, amidst all of these millions of people who are convinced they're born again, now and then one of them gets tired of trying to make like a believer uh, because they all are under the, under the mandate, you know, I'm a child of God, and therefore it ought to show in the way I live. I am a child of God. And yet sometimes you get weary. 
trying to go this uphill climb of trying to always do the will of God, when in actuality, that person hasn't been saved. He still loves this world very, very greatly. And it's an enormous temptation to be in this world with all of its glamour. And they have their friends that are having their good times who make no claims to be salvation. And so it's easy to to want to follow the world just a little bit. And so then we say, well, he fell from grace. No, he didn't fall from grace. He never knew what grace was. And unfortunately, that is the typical, oh, this is a terrible thing to say. That is the typical salvation that is found amongst the people of our day. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening, um, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I've been listening to you for over a year now, listening over and over your many studies, um, and I've gotten into the Bible myself, and I've uh, become, you know, really uh, in love with God's Word, and Many things I agree with you, and then other things I just have questions. And last night I was reading the book of Revelation, and I can't vote the, I mean, I can't tell you, quote this, the chapter or the verse, but I'm sure you're familiar with the, the verse. It's um, those that are under the altar that have been killed, and they ask, they ask God, how long, how long, Lord, until... He avenges, avenges their, those who killed them. And, and the Lord says, um, a little while, and he gives them white robes. Revelation, uh, let's read that from Revelation chapter 6. And, uh, I, uh, and when he had opened the fifth seal, this is verse 9, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and, and it was, and unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, we have to be careful when we read this. This is not saying that these souls under the altar who are, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They are under the altar. That's a figure of speech to indicate they're under the blessing, under the salvation program of Christ, and they actually are safe and secure in heaven. Because absent, if they were martyred, these are martyrs. They were killed for the sake of the of the gospel. But then they left their bodies and went to live and reign with Christ in heaven. And yet... There is a desire in their hearts that not for personal vengeance. Oh, those ugly, dirty people that took our life. Uh, that, that has to be fixed up. You know, that uh, justice has to be done. That is not the way it is. Because true believers love their enemies. They want the very best for them. But there's another side to this. And that is the desire of every true believer is that God's will be perfectly done and finished. And that is what is really being expressed here. How long will it be before the whole business of your justice will be completed? And it can't be completed until... Uh, we finally go through the period of great tribulation, right, which we're going through right now. And then we have to come into the day of judgment, the final 153 days. But that can't come until all of those who are to become saved have become saved. So there are going to be others 
who are going to be martyred as we go along. So just the, 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 the teaching here that God is giving us is we wait patiently for God's will to be done. We have to wait patiently for his will to be done in our personal lives. We have to wait patiently for God's will to be done in his overall program for planet Earth. And we know that when it's all done, we're finally going to come to the end of time and the whole universe, all the true believers will have, are safe and secure with Christ forevermore in the new heaven and the new earth. And this present universe is gone forever. It will never exist again. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, how you doing? Very well, thank you. I'm doing good. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, in the Bible it says that um, even if an angel comes down from heaven with a new gospel, we uh, shouldn't listen to it, right? So um, basically what you're teaching is brand new. You know, the... the uh, you know, the, uh, what you're saying that um, on May 21st, of 2011, the rapture is going to happen. So, you well, know, um, the, you see, we have to define gospel. Well, could you turn your radio down, please? That would help. Uh, we have to define gospel. Gospel is not what a person teaches. The gospel is the Bible. The Bible. Now, the Bible clearly shows that when we just have the Old Testament, that's, that's a part of the gospel, we got a, a, a certain amount of information concerning what the gospel is. Then God gave the New Testament, and that added to the fun, uh, fund of information that was available so that throughout the church age they would have a much, much better understanding of the gospel than was available to the nation of Israel before Christ came. But the Bible also assures us that many things were sealed up in the Bible, sealed us up for the time of the end. And God assures us that there is a uh, there is a, much additional information in the Bible, not because uh, we're finding some other uh, uh, accounts that God wrote of, of some kind. The same Bible, the same words that we've always had. But remember, it is God who has to give us understanding. And as we come to the time of the end, God will open our understanding. All right, now the big issue is, here comes an organization like Family Radio or an individual teaching from Family Radio, and he's teaching a lot of new things. Is he teaching a new gospel, or is he simply teaching what has always been the gospel, except as God is opening our spiritual ears and eyes to much new truth from that same gospel? If, if Family Radio, for example, came and said, you know, last week, I don't know why, and preachers do this all the time in these days, uh, last week I had a vision. I'll tell you, congregation, it was a wonderful vision, and God gave me some very significant words for me to tell you. And then he says something that he claims that he got from God in that vision or when he heard that voice or whatever. That is a false preacher because he is coming with the information that has been added to the word of God. But you'll never hear that on family radio. Or you better never hear it. It, it, it. Every word that we are teaching came from the Bible, the same Bible that has been around for 1,900 years. Not one word has been changed. But God is opening our eyes to all kinds of truth that we didn't have before. Now, to the uninitiated, they hear that and they say, Oh, well, well, he must be a false gospel. Look at all the new things that he's talking about. We've never heard about that in our church. Uh, he might, how can we trust him? 
Well, I, I can really quickly see why that would be said. But that's why we have a program like the Open Forum. Think of it. Five nights a week for an hour and a half, anybody can call up and say, Hey, Brother Camping, you, you said thus and so. Uh, what about this verse here? Uh, did you get that from the Bible? Or is that out of your own head? And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, that's a wonderful discipline to be under. Knowing that everything we teach is going to be sub subject to a great amount of scrutiny. And that's the way it ought to be so that we will be sure to be honest that it all came just from the Bible. But um, I, have, I have another question. But the, the thing is that I was Catholic for 29 years, right? And when I had a lot of questions that were in the Bible, you know, they, they, they always bring a book called the Catechism. And, you know, I wanted answers from the Bible, you know, not from the Catechism. So what's the difference between the Catechism and the book that you're teaching? Oh, well, now that's an excellent question because the Roman Catholic Church has the Catechism and the, the Reformed Churches and the Baptist Churches, they also have their doctrinal dissertations, they have their creeds, they have their confessions, the Lutheran Church does. And what the Church has done, uh, already beginning, oh, a uh, long, long, long time ago, uh, they began to think, you know, we have to start trying to uh, put some explanation about what the Bible is teaching so that we can understand it a little bit er better. And so they began to develop creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, Creed, and, uh, and so on. And then later on, the... Uh, uh, there were other catechisms and creeds that were developed, like the Westminster Confession, and the uh, that was in the Presbyterian Church, and the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Augsburg Confession in the Lutheran Church, and so on. Now, the the purpose of those creeds was to try to explain important doctrines of the Bible as simple as possible. And, and maintain them as the standard of truth. Uh, the, uh, because the Bible is so difficult in itself. So the purpose was quite good, uh, that hopefully this would, uh, would uh, guarantee that, that uh, the, ch the church later on would not go off on a, uh, on a fishing trip someplace and start changing the crates. And so, uh, for example, I grew up in a creedal church, the Christian Reformed Church, and the first thing that happened uh, that I learned was that if anybody came with a doctrinal idea, the first question that was raised, it does it agreed with our creeds. They In that church, they had the Heidelberg Catechism, the Canons of Dort, and the Belgian Confession which were basically quite good. They had a lot of, they had some errors in them, but we didn't know anything about that at the time. We assumed that they were as accurate as the Bible itself. And so the first thing that if any preacher or any elder came up with an idea, let's test it against the creed. But now the fact is a creed can't possibly cover all the material of the Bible. That's impossible. It only covers a few very important points, but there's a lot that it cannot cover simply because the Bible, look how, how, how many pages it has in it, and every page, every verse is very important. And yet in a creed, you're trying to summarize everything in a, some kind of a uh, timely fashion, and so there, there, you can only just barely scratch the surface as a matter of fact. But the problem was the creeds became as important as the Bible. They, there were even preachers who would preach sermons from the Heidelberg Catechism. Today we're going to uh, preach a sermon on uh, Lord's Day number 21, maybe, uh, and uh, that became their text rather than the than the Bible itself. And so that 
the creeds tended to supplant the Bible as their authority. But when we finally woke up to all of this and began to study the Bible, just the Bible, just the Bible, we found, yes, there were many things in the creed that were uh, quite well said, but we also found some things that were not. But we also found an enormous amount of truth that had never been covered in a creed. And yet that was also from the Word of God. So, uh, therefore, uh, today we don't encourage anybody to look at a creed uh, or at a confession. Look at the Bible. Get acquainted with the Bible. God has given to us, and we are able to talk about it together and have some understanding of how to understand it. And my, my, now we're really coming to truth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. The Bible said in our day a great multitude of people that no man can number will be saved. The Bible says in Revelation 7, I saw a great multitude which no man could number, and they were robed with white robes. Who are these with the white robes? The Bible goes on to say, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. What is the great tribulation? It is that 8,400 day period uh, that we are presently getting near the end of. Uh, and it's during that last 6,100 days of the 8,400-day period, we've worked, been able to work out the timeline with that kind of accuracy that this great multitude is coming into the kingdom of God all over the world. It has nothing to do with any activity from churches. It is not a, There is nobody becoming saved in any church anywhere in the world because the Holy Spirit is not present there. And in order for someone to become saved, God the Holy Spirit has to apply that word of God to the life of that individual and make him, give him a brand new resurrected soul. But we have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Yes, I just had a question. Um... I had a, people ask me, is, is Christianity the only way to be saved? Is that the only religion that's out there? And I didn't know how to answer them. All right? and so, you know, I, I know I... Is Christianity the only way to be saved? Uh, we lost our caller because we had a bad line, but the question was a very good question. The Bible teaches that faith, and in the Bible the word faith identifies with Christ. His name is faithful. He and it identifies with all the work that Christ had to do to save us. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's only one book in the whole wide world. It's the oldest book. It has, meant, has not been changed in 1900 years. And that is the Bible. And faith cometh by listening to the word of God, as that is, salvation comes as we hear the word of God and God applies it to our hearts. Now, there are all kinds of sincere, wonderful people out there. They're decent, they're moral, they're just, uh, they're just wonderful people. And yet they do not trust the Bible. Their Bible is not their authority in any way. Maybe they don't even know about the Bible. They cannot become saved unless they hear from the Word of God, the Bible. That is why God instructs those of us who are who have become saved to send that gospel, the Bible, into all the world. That is why on this program, for example, we encourage people to read the Bible, read the Bible. And we are so thankful that at least one good product came out of the church age 
And that is that they were able to get millions upon millions of Bibles out into the world. And it's been translated into many, many, many different languages. So that as we talk together here on a program like the Open Forum, people in Afghanistan or in Russia or in uh, Mexico or in in Brazil or where China or wherever, they can read the same verse that we're reading in the English language. They can read it in their Chinese Bible or their Russian Bible or whatever uh, uh, language it might be. And it's the same truth. And, and that is the key to salvation, that we listen and have a desire to be obedient and then cry to God for mercy. And maybe, maybe we also might be one of those that God planned to save. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Mr. Camping? Yes. Uh, where's the Apostle Creed wrong? And the Nicene Creed. That, that, that's the two creeds that uh, I grew up on. Yes. Now, the Apostles' Creed uh, is a very, very old creed. It was uh, one of the earliest creeds that was developed by the, by the churches that had the Bible. And it is... Uh, it is a, a very short creed, and, and it uh, is uh, fairly accurate in the Word of God. But you see, it, it, is, uh, 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 it, it cannot begin, it cannot begin to cover all the fantastic truth that we learn from the Bible. It, it in itself is fine, but it is not the Bible. It is only a, a, a statement that is emphasizing a few truths of the Bible. But there's the Bible, you know, when you listen to this program and you listen to all the complex questions and, and, and trying to explain this verse and that verse, no way can you cover that in a creed and certainly not in the Apostles' Creed. But it is a, it is a, one of the oldest, and it is a it in itself was a very uh, a well done creed. But it is not the Bible, and you cannot become saved by a creed. You have to listen to the Word of God, and the only Word of God is the Bible. No creed, the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed or any other creed, is the Word of God. Absolutely not. It is not the Word of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Oh, hi, Dr. Camping. Brother Camping, yes. Oh, no, you know why I called you Dr. Camping? I should have confirmed the degree on you called the BD, Bible Detective. You're really a Bible detective. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for but, that. But, but I want you to look at Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Yes, and you know the church, um, Christians disagree today over the meaning of certain passages of Scripture about the future of the Jews. So I want you to look at Romans 11, 1 to 5. Romans 11, 1 to 5. Yes. There we read, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And in this context, God is talking about national Israel, those who are blood descendants of Abraham. God forbid, for I also, the Apostle Paul is the scribe that God is speaking through to give us this message. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Uh, know ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah? How he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy, sh 
thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In other words, God is saying, look back in history, in the wicked days of Ahab, the king, a uh, wicked king of Israel, when everything looked so bad, and uh, Elijah was sure that there were no true believers left. God was saying, even in wicked Israel, which consisted of a couple of million people, there were still 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. That is, that they were true believers. But what saith the answer of God unto him? If he have reserved to myself 10,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, then so, even so, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. In other words, no matter how wicked Israel ever became at any time in its history, right down to the very present day, incidentally, there is a tiny remnant of true believers, as there is a remnant of true believers in every nation of the world. But God is not using the nation of Israel any longer uh, as a representation of the kingdom of God for 1,480 years from the time Israel came as a nation out of Egypt until Christ came. That was a period of 1,480 years. Uh, they represented, externally, they represented the kingdom of God on this earth. And then God shifted from the nation of Israel to the church age. And the church age, all the churches all over the world, became the external representation of the kingdom of God. But that doesn't mean that God had, uh, that there were no more true believers in national Israel, but it was only a tiny, tiny remnant of at any time. And he explains this further, you know. He says in, uh, in, uh, uh, he says, in verse 7, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election, that is the remnant, those that were chosen of God, hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded, according as it is written. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. In other words, there's a, a small number who do believe, whose eyes have been opened, whereas the rest, uh, they, they are blinded. And that would go on right to today. If we go to Romans chapter 11, we read in verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest he's talking now, now to the Gentile world, lest ye be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. In other words, while uh, most of them are in blindness, but there still is a remnant, a tiny remnant, that are true believers right to the present day, uh, 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 that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, this is a key statement, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That is, until God has finished saving whoever he plans to save throughout the world. Well, now, that means when the last individual anywhere in the world that God planned to save had become saved, that will still be the condition of national Israel, that basically they are in unbelief, they are blinded, but there's also a little remnant of them that are being saved. And But then when we get to the last person being saved, it's the end of the world. And so this tells us there will never be a change in national Israel. Again, um, you are a Bible detective, and you are a wonderful teacher, and I give you a lot of 
courage to bring up this program to help us because I finished seminary in San Diego and I'm still learning from you. And a lot of people that I've talked to about the end of the church age, uh, a professor I was talking to on Sunday told me that the end of the church age is at the rapture when the rapture takes place. That's the end of the church age. That's what the churches want to believe. That is an integral part of what they have been teaching during the church age, that the, when, uh, when uh, the Christ raptures, uh, comes to rapture the believers, he will rapture all those in the churches. They will be, still be in existence at that time as a, as a service to God, but they have arrived at that conclusion not because they have found it very clearly in the Bible. Theologians have liked that idea. They have taught it widely, and it has been believed very widely, but it, it will not square with the Bible at all. Now, now we have the problem that all these people have locked into their thinking <clears throat> this idea that the church will go all the way to the time of the rapture. They're convinced that is true. And so now anyone that comes along with the real truth of the Bible, that, uh, that the, no, the church age ended uh, 23 years before the rapture, uh, they will say, we don't believe it. We don't believe it because it doesn't agree with what we have been taught and what we have they don't say it quite this crassly or, or openly, but we, what is locked into our mind is that we know that the church will go to the end. And therefore, everything we can talk about the end of the church age or the fact that Christ is not coming as a thief in the night, they will not listen. They will not listen because they know, no, no, we have been taught a long time ago by very excellent Bible teachers that uh, Christ is coming as a thief in the night and that the church age will go right up until the time of the rapture. And so uh, they just won't listen anymore. They're, they're, uh, they just immediately write off these other things as being heresy. In fact, there are a lot of people, they are given a book, I hope, I mean, we're almost there, which strictly comes from the Bible altogether, and yet they won't even read it because they say, well, it can't be true. That's heresy. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And I don't want to be uh, try have somebody try to come to me and teach me heresy. I want to stay with what I know to be gospel truth that I have been taught uh, during the years I have been in my church. And so the poor people, they just, they just stay in their unbelief and they never, they aren't open to what the, uh, to what the Bible is teaching. They're, they have been totally captivated and brainwashed by what they have been taught in their churches. Thank you very much, Brother. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Um, actually, the discussion that uh, you were just having is a great segue into my specific question, uh, which is related to Matthew 24:36. Uh, I guess I'm having a little trouble understanding uh, that scripture in light of uh, the information that you've provided, the dates that you've provided for the end of, well, of, see, of the world. The, the problem is that these, this is the Bible. It was not God's intention. It was not God's intention. We can show this from the Bible. That throughout the church age, and the church age extended over a period of 1,955 years, that the scholars, the Bible teachers, the members of the churches should be concerned with trying to determine the end of the world, the timing of the end of the world. Therefore, God placed in the Bible in strategic places, sentences that seem to assure us beyond a measure, without a question of doubt, that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. We can't know anything about the exact timing. 
And uh, this is one of the verses that where he has done that. And we find a number of verses like that. But now that we are at the end of the world and God is opening our eyes to a lot more truth of the Bible, we find, but, but, when we get to the end of the world and we're past the time of the church age, and that ended 20 years ago, when we're past the end, the time of the church age, then I'm going to open your eyes and there's a lot more truth I am going to give to you. It's been sealed up until this time. And now we find <clears throat> that, yes, we can know the precise uh, day and month and year of Christ's return. Why? Because now we have also the enormously important task of warning a world of almost 7 billion people that the end is almost here. Where now all the true believers are walking in the shoes of Noah when he had to build that ark and and uh, then tell the people of the world of his day the exact day when God would shut the door. He's in, we're all in the same shoes as Jonah as he had to go to Nineveh and tell that city in 40 days. He was giving them the exact date when God was going to destroy that city. And now we have that same task. We have to tell the world. And we can't tell the world unless we know what it is. And so now God has given us an enormous amount of new information. It's not a different Bible. It's right from the same Bible. But And, and here, Family Radio and its role as being a servant of the Lord, we simply have put all of this, uh, searched this out in the Bible and prayed for wisdom and prayed for wisdom. And then when we have been sure that we're on the right track, now we are publishing this. That's why we make available a book like we're almost there, so anybody can check it out for themselves. They don't, they don't want to check, they don't want to trust that book, but they, if they look at that book, they'll find that everything there came from the Bible. And so there, uh, but that's what we have to trust is the Bible. And of course, this becomes a huge test for the billions of people. And about two billion people in the world today claim that they are a follower of Christ. They claim that somehow they're right with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole test is, if we are a follower of Christ, what is the ultimate authority that governs our life? Our church? Our creed? Our good life? What really is the ultimate authority? It is the Bible. And so God's put the test to it. Is the Bible your authority or is your church what you have believed that you have been taught throughout the church age? Is that your authority? And you can't have both. Uh, and if the Bible is not the only authority, I'll tell you, then we are not a child of God. Uh, because the Bible is the is uh, is the Word of God. In fact, it identifies with Christ Himself. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes, uh, I'm I'm struggling with how one can trust the Bible unless, if, if it depends on God opening your eyes to even understanding the Bible. Well, In other words, it, if people can read the, people read the Bible every day, and yeah. unless God has opened your eyes to understanding the Bible... Then there's no hope for you to even understand. Well, but that's the Bible. That's the reason that as we read the Bible, we just don't read it like another book. We read it praying, "Oh Lord, open my eyes." Now, we might read a whole chapter of the Bible or a couple of chapters, 
And almost all the verses seem so complicated. We can't really understand what God is saying. Yet we're, we want to be praying. Oh, Lord, open my spiritual eyes. And then we run across a verse that we can understand a little bit. And so we pray. We read it ten times and, and look at, it, at those words. And, and uh, we uh, maybe if we have a concordance, we begin to uh, look at some of the words in that verse as they're found elsewhere in the Bible. And we study, study. And, and to help us, that's what the role of Family Radio is. We're a teacher. We, we try to help people to understand. We don't want them to trust us. We want to just show them how they can look in the Bible and begin to discover truth. And now every, we are, uh, how much we understand is not a function of whether we're saved or not. But if we are a child of God, the big thing that is happening in our life, that we become very obedient. Oh, Lord, whatever I do understand, help me to be obedient. And we also have an attitude toward the Bible, even though we don't understand that it is a holy book. It is God's Word. I have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Welcome to the open forum. Yeah, uh, Uh, yeah, Mr. Camping. Go ahead with your call. Um, Hello? Hello? Yeah, um, I need to... Uh, have an input about. Uh, first, first uh, of, may I encourage you to turn your radio off? Yeah, I did. I just did. Oh, okay. I just did. I need to have an input about um, um, <clears throat> how the uh, how the the, the coming of um, of uh, this. Uh, in fact, I want to talk about this Catholic Church because it has been things about the Catholic Church has been raised in these uh, programs so much that um, uh, they always try to feel that they are the supreme head of a church. Um, I remember way back in the 50s and when we were growing up, even in the rural areas, do you know they present their services in Latin? In Latin to those who don't even speak English. And they are talking about Bible. They don't have. They don't read Bible in their church. Who says they have? They, who? I mean, people have been calling in about Catholic Church doing this and doing that. They are the first and they are, they are, they are the supreme distance. I mean, way back in the fifties when we were growing up, they used to they used to present their services in Latin. Yeah, well, you they see, they don't read Bible. Yeah, excuse me. You see. Every church, and the Roman Catholic Church has a long heritage. It is one of the biggest, by all odds, it is the largest church that identifies in any way with the Bible that exists in the world. It is certainly the oldest, uh, and it has built in a huge number of practices that they believe are holy practices, and they... There's there's one good thing that has happened out of the Roman Catholic Church, and that is they have instilled in the people who call themselves Catholic a fear of God. Uh, They uh, so that uh, those who are Roman Catholic understand that God is still God. However, they are not made acquainted with the Bible, uh, and like you say, many of the masses. Or, or, or the Eucharist are done in Latin, and uh, so nobody can understand at all what's going on. But even if it were done in their own language, it makes no difference. It's all man-made. It doesn't follow uh, the Bible accurately at all. But it is a religion that people can or think they can trust in and if they are a good Roman Catholic uh, the God the Catholic Church will take them uh, save make them safe from the cradle to the grave <laughs> and even if if there was a doubt about it when they get to the grave 
There's even purgatory that they'll pray you out of. And so it is all man-made, totally man-made, using the Bible as somewhat of a basis for it. Here and there, they uh, do follow a few things of the Bible. But, uh, but basically, it is simply a religion designed to please men and please uh, the church itself. So, but today, today, and there's no church that we can say it's a better church than the Roman Catholic or the Roman Catholic is a better church than someone else. Every church is under the the scrutiny of God today. Uh, God is pre- preparing the people in those churches for their time at the, in the day of judgment. This is awesome, really awesome when we think about it. Uh, the day of judgment is coming in three years. We know this from the Bible. And those who will endure the greatest shame and also be the most tormented or most, uh, uh, most troubled and unhappy and uh, uh, saddened and, and sorrowing because of what they, what's going to be happening to them are those who claimed to be Christians. Because they're going to realize they've been left behind. They're under the judgment of God. And now they've lost this world. And they've lost all the inheritance that they were waiting for. The new heaven and the new earth. And eternal life. It's all gone. And it's going to be an enormous, enormously terrible time for them. Uh, Although there will also be uh, four or five billion people from who knew nothing about the Christian faith of any kind and they'll be there too but their shame will not be nearly as great and their their uh, uh, sorrow will not be nearly as great because they didn't know anything at all about the Bible taught but then it'll all end up with death and, and totally uh, non-existence anymore by the end of the Day of Judgment, which comes on October 21, 2011, the whole universe will be gone. It will be burned up and gone forevermore. But here is the wonderful thing. For the next three years, God is saving a great multitude, which no man can number. And they can come from the Roman Catholic Church or from the... Uh, from the uh, uh, Muslim community or from the Buddhist community or in fact God in, uh, encourages us that there are great many of those who are coming into the body of believers today come from those who are identified with the Muslim community as well as other, other uh, 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 religious groups of the world as long as they begin to trust in what the Bible is saying, and it, it, uh, that is, they begin to cry out to God for mercy, maybe God will save us too. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campbell. How are you? Very well, thank you. And I just want to make a comment. You're doing a great job. You have a lot of common sense and a lot of knowledge of the Bible, and I greatly appreciate your teaching. Um, I just had two quick questions. One, do you do any book signings? I'm in a New York area. The other question was people around that were in the churches were asking me about the Christian faith. Uh, is that the only religion, the Christianity religion? Is that the only religion that has, has to be, you have to be a Christian to be saved, and do you have to be born again to be saved? And the other question, and I'll take everything off the air, was or actually a statement. I'm, without mentioning my name, I'm a performer in New York area, and I'm planning on doing some radio and television talk shows. And I want to get the message out on the television talk shows that I well, hear well, on. Well, you, you know, uh, your first question, any book signings, the reason that there are book signings is because people are trying to sell their books. Uh, we have begun to follow and have tried to follow this principle uh, throughout the era of family radio as closely as possible. 
uh, that uh, freely you have received, freely give. And so we have quite a number of books that have been produced by Family Radio, and we give them away. We're not a, we're not trying to sell them to anybody, and so we don't have book signings. We're not we're not uh, we they're just available. We're not trying to make any money. Uh, we people have book signings because they're trying to get rich on their book, and there's not that's not our idea at all. Our idea is simply to give it away, and the more we give, the more it costs us. And we're just thankful that people are giving you family radio so that we can do these things. Now, the uh, the uh, other thing is that you are a TV and radio host in New York City. It's very interesting that we have tried to talk to the uh, media. Uh, we have sent copies of some of our key books to every uh, uh, noted commentator that we could think of and uh, to the news media wherever and uh, the moment we started talking about the uh, end of the world and giving a date for the end of the world we have not heard from anybody the whole media is in denial they do not want to talk about it now if someone would call uh, tomorrow and say, look, I would like to do an interview with you camping about what you're teaching about the end of the world uh, 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 for this TV show or for this radio program. I'll tell you, I would be very happy, happy to do that interview in a moment. But it's just not happening anywhere. Uh, we've, we've sent our material and, and I'll tell you, Family Radio has been around for 49 years. We are in all the major cities for a long, long time. The Open Forum program, this program, has been on the air more than 45 years uh, with the same host. And, and yet uh, nobody, and so the media know about us. Absolutely, they know about us, but they don't want to put this kind of information out in the, in the media. We, but in the meanwhile, we're putting it out. Uh, we're translating this, this kind of material into 35 different languages, and we're really practically blanketing the whole world so that potentially virtually anybody in the world uh, can hear this, uh, hear, learn about this through shortwave radio or through Internet. Those are two of the major ways in which they can hear it. And, uh, and so the world is hearing about it, whether the media likes it or not. But uh, the media, no. That, that, uh, you can just see the, 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 the headlines. Uh, the world is going to end in three years, I'll tell you. Uh, it, that, that would, uh, the world just doesn't want to hear that. The churches themselves are in complete denial. They do not want to recognize this at all in any way. Uh, did you hear me, Mr. Camping? I'm sorry? I, yes, I just said basically, before you get to my other uh, question about do you have to be a Christian, is that the only religion, and do you have to be born again Christian in order to be saved? Before you get to that question, that answer or that question, I do work in New York radio and television. And is there another number I can contact you? Because I'd love to have you on the air. Well, if you want to, if you want to uh, contact me, call um, call uh, any day uh, at our office. The number is uh, you can call at one eight hundred five four three fourteen ninety five and ask for me. Uh, tell them that you are a commentator, and uh, uh, or, or call 568, area code 510, 568-6200. Now, that's our business phone, and sometimes uh, it gets uh, kind of busy, so it might be hard to get through, but if you, you can get through, 568-6200, area code 510. And I'll be glad to talk to you. That sounds great. And I'm looking forward to maybe even meeting you one night. Um, just the other question, if you can, real quick. 
about as far as Christianity. I have a lot of church members saying, what, is Christianity the only religion that's going to be, that you have to be out of all the other re- religions? See, here's, said, here, here's you, the problem. There's a problem. And that is, uh, religion is not what saves anybody. We can all be decent, moral people. We can all say we love the Lord and so on. But the problem is our sin. We have to find somebody to make payment for our sin. Because the Bible declares that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, okay, Uh, that means we're all in trouble because we've all sinned. And so we have to find somebody who will take our place. And the Bible shows us that it is only the Lord Jesus Christ, only the Lord Jesus Christ, who made payment for the sins of those that God intends to save. And, and that is the, that is the real serious point in the whole business of getting right with God. Christ has to become my Savior, and that's only taught in the Bible. Therefore, only those who have been listening to the Word of God, to the Bible, have any possibility of ever becoming saved. And uh, and now when you say born again, that means simply that when, when God saves a person, and that's totally God's work, when God saves a person, he is given a brand new resurrected soul. That's what it means to be born again. It's like we're born all over again. We were born with a spirit essence or a soul, but in that soul we are in rebellion against God. And when we when he saves us, he gives us a brand a new soul in which we now can... Uh, uh, in which we, uh, it's an eternal soul that we live with him forevermore in that soul. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Kathy? Yes. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Um, I have a question about Isaiah. Um, I believe it's in chapter 3 where it talks about... Um, the nation, basically at the end of the world, the nation saw saying about Satan, wondering you, if it was him um, that caused the nations to tremble. How does that play in with the end of the world? Well, now, uh, Isaiah 3, and what verse are you talking about? Uh, I'm not sure about the verse, but I believe you're, um, it's when, it's basically, I believe it's at the end of the world where people are asking, is this he basically talking about Satan that caused the nations to tremble? Well, Isaiah 3, uh, of course, is talking about our day, definitely. Uh, he does say in verse uh, 4, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another. This is talking about how bad it is in the churches that they are being offered Gospels that are not faithful to the Word of God. Uh, We read, uh, uh, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed, every every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. And then it says, and this is difficult language, but when we sort it out, we know it means, Uh, We can understand what it means. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people, for Jerusalem is ruined. And Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Jehovah to provoke the eyes of his glory. And the show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Now, 
All of this is talking about the situation that has been in the churches uh, during the last 20 years. That that uh, it says there's no bread and there's no clothing. The bread is the bread of life. They're not teaching the true gospel any longer. The clothing is the robe of Christ's righteousness to cover our sins. And they are not, uh, they don't have any understanding any longer about what salvation really is. And so you are correct that this chapter is talking about our day, but it's a very difficult chapter. And just in a couple of minutes here on the open forum, it's impossible to really explain it all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, we, uh, I, I've been hearing your, um, that uh, the Lord is coming back in, in, in May uh, of, of 11. And um, where are we at right now with the... Uh, <clears throat> With this Mediterranean Antichrist that's supposed to rise uh, in through Israel, um, did he rise yet? And where is he? Well, and you, you see, for years and years and years, and I too believe this for many years that the Antichrist would be some individual that was a very, very prominent theologian. Uh, uh, a prominent man, a man in the churches, but he would also be a very prominent uh, p- political figure of some kind, and that Satan would indwell him, and he would make his appearance. But years and years ago, as I was reading through the Bible, I suddenly realized who the Antichrist is, uh, because God has revealed him to us, and the Antichrist is Satan. It's not some human being. We read in First John, First John, let me turn to that a moment. In First John chapter, First John chapter 4, we read if, uh, in verse 3, First John chapter 4, verse 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that of Antichrist. Uh, This is that of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that he should come, and even now already is he in the world. And I remember reading this years ago, and I thought, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he was already in the world when this was being written, which was 2,000 years ago, and if he's going to come at the end of time, he certainly is not a human being, because no human lives to be 2,000 years old. But there is someone that fits Antichrist to a T, and that is Satan. He existed 2,000 years ago, And from what we read in the Bible, he's very active in our day as God has appointed him to rule in all of the churches. And he is the Antichrist. God has revealed him to us. He comes, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, he comes as an angel of light. And his minister is... (laughs) me and his ministers they are the pastors in all the churches that he rules over they really are now his emissaries they think they are serving Christ but in actuality they are serving Satan he is the Antichrist who has come now because he's a spirit we can't see him but he does exist very very definitely But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. You had a caller about three calls ago was interested in a verse that says, Is this the man that made the earth tremble? And that was Isaiah 14, 16. 
Isaiah 14, 16? Yes, sir. Let, let me read that, and I thank you for that. Isaiah 14, verse 16. There we read, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Yes, that is talking about Satan, definitely. But thank you for sharing that. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Good night. Um, can you... I, last time I called, I... I'm sorry. Hello? Brother Kevin, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello. Go ahead with your call. Yeah, um, last month when I called, I asked you to read First King 22, 21 to 23. I, I'm of oh, First yes. Kings chapter 21. First King 22, 21 to 23. First Kings, let me look at that a minute. First Kings, chapter 22. 20, yeah, 22 to 21, 23. 21 to 23. No, chapter 22. There we read, And there came forth a spirit, and stood before Jehovah, and so said, I will persuade him. Uh, and, uh, and Jehovah said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, there, this is at a time when God is dealing with the kings of Israel and of uh, Judah. They're at war with Syria, and uh, and... Uh, and uh, God wants to, to have uh, certain lies come into the mind of the king of, of uh, Israel, and so he's going to do that through a lying spirit. Now, we're, we're a little bit abhorred when we first read this statement. You mean to say that God actually will put a lie into a man's heart and he answers, yes, God uses even Satan and the evil spirits to get his work done. For example, you remember that Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians. And the Bible clearly teaches that it was God who brought this wicked nation of Babylon that represented the kingdom of Satan against Jerusalem to destroy it. Uh, God put, uh, he re we read in Ezekiel 37, I will put hooks in their mouth and bring them against uh, my people. And because God is ruler over everything, and he can, he, can, uh, 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 he can use the angels, or he can use the evil spirits, he can use anybody to get his work done. Now, that doesn't mean God is the author of sin. The sin comes from these individuals, but God can utilize that propensity to sin. But now I have to say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.